Hey, hi, how's it going? Well, being, well, blah, 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 blah. happy Thursday. Blah, blah, blah. I can talk, I can talk. Welcome to another edition of Midas Letter Raw. And uh, today I'm here with my good friend and CFA colleague, Steve Miser. Not that I'm a CFA, I'd have to go to school for that. And believe me, they would throw me out rather than give me a certificate to graduate. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm good, James. Pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here. We're going to start with a little bit of cannabis news just to keep you all updated on what's going on. So today, get this. British Columbia's sole legal wholesaler of medical cannabis has entered into agreements with 31 licensed producers to ensure a retail supply for when non-medical cannabis is legalized. Additionally, the liquor distribution branch has secured a location for its BC cannabis store within Kamloops Columbia Place Shopping Centre. Uh, and also in the news today, FSD Pharma CSE listed HUGE announced a binding agreement to purchase a 51% of Atlantic Island Cannabis to be renamed FSD Atlantic Pharma effective July 4th, 2018. Hmm. The agreement involves an investment of 40 million bucks to drive production and sales of legal cannabis in the province of Newfoundland. Can you imagine a high Newfie, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> That's gotta be crazy. Canada Royalty Corp, our daily newsmaker lately, CSE listed CRZ, announced that they have acquired the exclusive rights to distribute and manufacture Pacific Remedies infused pre-rolls in California in exchange for a royalty fee. The agreement also provides Canada Royalty with the option to fully acquire Pacific Remedies global brand rights. Canada Royalty also announced they've, uh, bleh, they've closed their previously announced private placement, raising gross proceeds of, get this, $32.9 million Canadian. Wow. Congratulations to Mark Lustig and the crew at, at Canna Royalty, ratcheting it up ever, 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 again and again and again. Where am I going with this? The proceeds from the financing will be primarily used to expand its footprint across California as well as for general corporate and working capital purposes. Medrelief Corp, soon to be renamed Aurora Corp, TSX listed LEA. LEAF announced they will sponsor a cancer trial to improve the management of cancer pain using medical grade cannabis oil. The aim of the trial is to assess the effect efficacy of cannabis oil in relieving cancer patient symptoms and to gain information on the best oral dosing regimen. Patients will receive an oil combining THC and CBD. Sounds like a good idea. Blissco Cannabis Corp, CSE listed BLIS, announced they've signed an agreement with Green Seal Cannabis to purchase 1,700 kilos of dried cannabis and 340 kilos of trim in a two year deal. Trim, the shake. This agreement provides Blissco with the ability to sell Green Seal's dried cannabis to Blissco's medical patients or adult recreational customers in Canada when it is legal. You think they're going to sell the shake? I don't think so. Uh, they're also going to export medical cannabis to the countries where it's legal. And uh, Oxley Cannabis Group, TSX Venture listed XLY, formerly Cannabis Wheaton, announced that Ian McKay has resigned as a director of the company's board of directors to become CEO of a federal agency, Invest in Canada. The Hydropothecary Corporation, TX, TSX listed HEXO, announced they've granted stock options to certain directors, officers, and non-executive employees to acquire a total of 5.7 million common shares of the company. All the options will be exercisable at 489 a share with a term of 10 years. Boy, that's a sweet deal. Yeah, 10-year options are the sweetest. Oh my gosh, Stevie, what are we doing? Why, where's our marijuana grow up? Where's our option package? It's like a lottery ticket, a 10-year option, really. I know, man, that's like something you never have to worry about. I mean, chances are you'll forget about it and you'll get a call from somebody one day and say, hey, did you know your options are worth 32 bucks? Those are the sweet calls to get. Never had one, have you? Ever had an exit like that where you get a long-term warrant or option or something that you just forgot about and somebody calls and says, Hey, you might want to unload on some of this. Uh, I wouldn't say I've forgotten about it, but it does help to get the reminder. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So what are we going to talk about today, Steve? Well, I think it's noteworthy uh, that the uh, interest rates went up yesterday mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, only a quarter point. That's mm -hmm. several several quarter point or two, 20, you know, uh, 25 basis point hits uh, in the last year, but the trend continues. You don't know if they're trying to defend the dollar here in Canada. 
uh, because obviously rate pressures continue on the rise in the U.S. and if they don't raise rates to match it, because really interest rate policy is not set here. It's really tagging along with what's going on in the U.S., but our economy is nowhere near as strong hmm. as the U.S. Did is. Did they raise rates in the States? Uh, no, not, not, uh, not, not yesterday. So what is our federal fund rate right now? Uh, I think it's one and a half. And the U.S.? Um, not sure. It's still should, pretty much free money. I mean, should know. It's uh, it's super cheap. I read that there was eight hundred billion dollars worth of stock repurchases planned by uh, Fortune five hundred companies this year. So oh yeah, still the hu go. huge buybacks. Huge so this buybacks. is this is this is a case where the low cost of capital is making it more worthwhile for a company to buy back their stock than yes. it is to actually deploy it into risky new investments. Yes, yeah. When, when it's cheaper to buy your own shares and that's more accretive to earnings than to try to expand into some other territory or build new plant and equipment, then it's, it's material. Yeah, and so this arguably is going to keep that Dow and S&P 500 in that upward Rise. It, it will. It also means that those big companies that are doing buybacks, we have the other side, they don't need to issue more shares either. Right. I mean, Canadian banks are generally in that uh, realm. They, they, they never issue common shares. They, they fund mostly through uh, preferred shares on a regular rolling basis, but yep. they, they don't buy, uh, they don't issue common shares rarely. And uh, that's just a sign of their strength. Yeah. I think it's noteworthy though as well, uh, and I don't know if we're going to be able to get the chart up or not, but uh, uh, that in Canada... Which chart are you looking for? Um, well, we were talking in the, uh, in the Intel room there about the uh, Bank of International Settlement chart. Oh, oh they chart. have it there. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I don't have a pointer with me, sadly, but on the, uh, the fourth bar on the uh, left chart here is Canada. And what this is, it's a little hard to read, but it, it shows uh, from the Bank of International Settlements the rise in, uh, in, in household debt uh, in various countries around the world as a percentage of GDP in the last 10 years. So again, the increase in the debt loads for uh, Canadians. And I think it's noteworthy that we're fourth uh, in the uh, mid 20s, or sorry, uh, maybe around 23% hike uh, in the last 10 years versus China, Norway, Thailand. They're really not relevant to our picture in this, in this uh, example. But what's key is that those small 25 basis points, a quarter point interest rate hike doesn't really seem like much, mm -hmm. even if we've had uh, a few since last summer. But when Canadians are fairly leveraged, uh, in their real estate and in their personal spending habits, even 25 basis points, a quarter percent can be marginally influential. Hmm. So I did hear that also that the rate of defaults was expected to rise in this, in this quarter upcoming in Canada. Yeah, I think that's going to be common in Europe as well. Uh, so is that directly related to the incremental rise in, in interest rates? Yeah, it means that money's been easy, and that means that lenders have been able to, uh, that borrowers have been able to get money easier in the past, and they've been able to pay it on, on smaller, skinnier interest rates, and the risk premiums have been generally low in a buoyant economy and an optimistic lending cycle. So you only tweak it a little bit. You only tick it up a little bit, and it's that marginal borrower, that marginal corporate entity, that marginal individual, that marginal uh, real estate player where the hikes start to, to bite. Sure. Now the, the Fed uh, still has a balance sheet worth over $4.5 trillion, correct? Mm -hmm. And Europe also, they've just finally stopped uh, issuing bonds, or basically buying their own paper. Yeah, you never really know exactly what they're up to because they have so many pockets. Same with the Fed. They're, they're always just cycling it around. Yeah. And, and when you look at Europe, you're really looking at the king, which is the Germans. Yeah. Hmm. So do you think that uh, macroeconomically, is this generally net good that interest rates are rising in the face of, you know, shorter term geopolitical tensions like the trade war with China? We're assuming that's going to be short-lived because, I mean, that's not a situation that can be allowed to escalate. It can't, uh, but I mean, I, and that was, those were my comments yesterday. I thought it would be short-lived, but I mean, each, it's a very, uh, you know, a very fluid situation and uh, it's kind of like a potential escalation. Well, I'm putting tariffs on your stuff, you're putting it, 
and and there is this potential uh, cycle situation. Um, so and and hard to know initially. Is it inflationary because the price of goods goes up for consumers? Is that a temporary thing? Hopefully, uh, because that can affect interest rates. But also, is it going to have real economic GDP effect when uh, the higher prices lead to? you know, uh, a reduced economic activity in both directions. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. To this point, uh, my best guess and, and what I've been reading is suggests that this is uh, simply uh, Trump's way of uh, the art of the deal, is you have to put up the strong front, you have to walk away and say the talks I read yesterday, the talks uh, between China and the U.S. are not going well, but that's how the, the, the North Korea talks went. They were on, people were smiling, then suddenly they were off. And then they went back to the table. But it's by walking away a little bit that you kind of strengthen your position. That's not mm. just Trump's book, but it's a lot of uh, history. Sure, sure. The, art, the Art of War by Sun Tzu Absolutely. actually recommends when things are in your favor, show a, th throw, show a strong front or something like that. I can't remember. We'll come back to that. Anyways... Brilliant analysis as usual. We'll be right back to talk more about the macroeconomic situation in the world today and a lot more about cannabis. But right now, right this second, I'm going to have a conversation with Jay Wilgar from New Strike. documentary. You hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest this segment is Jay Welger. He's the CEO of New Strike, trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol HIP. Jay, thanks for joining me. Thank you, James. Jay, uh, New Strike has had an amazing run through the markets, almost married to Canamed. Aurora steps in, steals the wife, yep. New Strike's yep. out in the wind, giant treasury, pivot, tilt, move, regroup. Tell me what's going on with New Strike now. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. It. it has been a, a fascinating year for us, as you can imagine. You know, we started off uh, trading as a public company last year, um, certainly after we announced our partnership, uh, business partnership with, with the Tragically Hip, which mm -hmm. was very exciting in and itself. And then very quickly, we, we started looking at the potential transaction with Canamed and, and really at the time made a lot of sense for us as a combination. Canamed, of course, being one of the most established cannabis companies in Canada. Right. And, and us with a very brand focused uh, go-to-market strategy, really, really in the recreational market. And, um, you know, I certainly wasn't expecting to get thrown in the middle of a, of a hostile takeover situation six months in. And... Uh, but that being said, you know, I think we actually came through that in, in a much stronger way than I think the market thought we would. You know, we got a break fee that was pretty significant. We had raised uh, $90 million within three days of, of the transaction uh, not happening. And then you, you may be aware we just raised another $55 million in total. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're certainly sitting on a, a very strong balance sheet right now. Uh, and our operations are very strong. So we're, we're, uh, we're executing on, on exactly what we were doing a year ago. Just having gone through the, the turmoil of, uh, right. of that situation. Yeah. Okay. So um, you've got you've changed the name of the company to New Strike Brands. Is that we have yeah. from that? I'm assuming we can read that you're going to be focused on the consumer packaged brand space in the cannabis space. You you acquired a ACMPR grower, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, we an, an application. Oh, okay. We had acquired. Late That's stage right. application. That's, That's correct. Up, up up cannabis. Well, so yes. Yeah, so New okay. Strike. Uh, was really the name New Strike really came about through the RTO transaction that we had done, and hence the name Resources. So the idea of moving it now to New Strike Brands with yeah. Up um, was was really about the fact that we are a brand focused company right now. Yeah. We certainly have an eye to international markets. There's no question about that. But what we realized early on was that there are you know quite a few players here in the Canadian marketplace. A lot of them really focused on the medical side of things and. And if you look at a lot of the names of companies and, and you know, call it the brands that were out there, we, we saw a really big opportunity to say, let's create uh, a brand that stands out, that's simple to Canadians, that mm -hmm. is catchy, that we can, you know, we can, we can really uh, play around with the branding side of this. Understanding, of course, that the regulations that we work within are, are very controlled. Right. And, and we get that. Um, so we're working closely with Health Canada on those things, closely with our partners in the Tragically Hip and, and others. Uh, in creating recognizable brands for Canadians in the rec market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then 
Um, is the is the relationship with the hip still very much a part of what you're about to do? It is, yeah. I, I mean, last week you may have seen we hosted a, a really interesting event uh, called the New Farm, where the Tragically Hip were, were present, of course, and, uh -huh. and they've been a great partner for us uh, from day one. And I, you know, I always talk about the fact if you think about people that understand Canada and understand Canadians, you'd be hard pressed to find a group of guys that has spent more time traveling across this country and, and talking to people and understanding what you know what Canadians are really all about so when we integrate them into our overall plan uh, they're very active with us and, mm -hmm. and, and they really are I mean the, the idea of that partnership w was a business partnership it was not a promotional type thing and, and you know I think you see that with them on a on a the way we interact with them and work with them um, and they're excited about it too I mean they, they talk sure. very openly about their excitement yeah. and, uh, so it's, it's also a lot of fun amazing um, so how soon till Up Cannabis is a licensed grower then, do you think? So we, we are fully licensed. We have oh, been are. fully okay. licensed. Yeah. So we've been actually growing now for 18 months. Oh, okay. And we have two facilities. Mm -hmm. Our Brantford facility is a relatively small indoor, um, almost medical style facility that we built starting five years ago. And that site has been licensed now since uh, December of 2016. So we've been producing there actually for a year and a half. And most of our production there is actually stockpiled for the recreational market. Okay. So unlike most producers, we haven't gone out and, and created a medical side. We really said, okay, let's focus our products and our strains on the recreational market. So we've got several thousand kilograms in vaults right now. Oh. And then our second facility that we bought in Niagara uh, last July one of the most high-tech greenhouse facilities in North America. Hmm. And it used to actually grow orchids. Hmm. And so we are converting, or we've converted that now into a very large scale uh, cannabis producing facility that is also licensed. So we have plants in there right now. Um, and at its peak, it will produce around 30,000, depending on the strain, 30 or, or plus thousand kilograms of, of cannabis per year. Wow. And then within that facility, we also are expanding production uh, capacity for oils and derivative products that we see as being a big part of our market, mm -hmm. uh, certainly going forward. You know, we talk about vape pens or you talk about other edible products. Uh, we right. have a strategy to go very hard at that market as well. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, so, so you're, that's interesting. You're one of the only companies I've ever talked to who said, no, we're not even participating in the medical business, we're going straight to recreational. Does that sort of impact the way you grow or the strains you grow or the type, the mix of sort of output yeah. you, you target? Funny enough, no. I mean, you know, the products that we actually grow, and, and I think we've, we've taken a different tack than a lot of, lot of the licensed producers on a few fronts. So the one thing we, we don't do, and, and you, you know, a lot of companies talk about, well, we've got 35 strains. Mm -hmm. We look at this and say, okay, that's a confusing number for a consumer. Canadians really actually don't know as much about cannabis as, as you'd think. And I think even people that have been using it for years are not necessarily that educated on, you know, the multiple types of strains that exist out there. So we looked at it and said, okay, what, what strains are selling in North America really well? And the difference between a medicinal strain and a non-medicinal strain, when you grow it at the level where we're required to grow it at, which is Health Canada standard, which is very, very high, um, there's really no difference. I mean, we could sell our, our current products as medicinal products. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, one strain that is a very, very high THC strain that, that would be a perfect medicinal product. And we also grow one that is um, very, very high in CBD, which is generally considered the, the more medicinal um, of the two. Right. And um, so, no, our, our five strains that we're really focused on um, could be used for either. Mm -hmm. But we also decided just focus on five. And you think about a beer company, it'd be unusual if you had a beer company that had 45 different beers to choose from. Right. And so the view for us is from, from the get-go, let's go to the market with things that resonate with consumers and that they can understand right. and, and keep it a little bit simple. Okay. So that's really been the strategy. Wow. So, I mean, the one thing that's always impressed me about New Strike is the, you guys are able to raise capital in the face of what would otherwise, for other companies, would be a game wrecker, yep. never mind changer. <laughs> and so, you know, every, every bad thing that happens to you, you just turn around and raise more money. So to me, that's like, well, there's, there's the example of how a late stage entrant into the game mm -hmm. can survive. If you've got access to capital, you can pivot and turn and regroup and rebrand Many times. Many times, and yeah. so uh, well, and, and to that point, you know, when you look at the fact we've got our two sites which we own, we've got uh, over 120 million dollars in cash in the bank, we've got significant inventory, uh, several thousand kilograms that that we're, we're 
now looking to get into the recreational market. So I think we're actually extremely well positioned. Mm -hmm. And you know, certainly the question I know that people always ask is, well, what's going on with your, with your stock price? What's going on with this? Our focus is really executing on this business plan. And I think when you look at the fundamentals that we're building within New Strike, I think they remain extremely strong, to, to your point. You know, we, we, we are pretty tight, but we are also capable of, of pivoting very quickly um, and have the ability to do so, certainly financially. Right. So it's game on for you guys, essentially, on October 17th. You've got to deal with Alberta. We do. And uh, I'm assuming that you're working on deals with other we outlets certainly and strategies? Are. We certainly are, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then internationally, uh, have you got a footprint yet? So internationally, we're working on an international strategy right now. And, and again, one of the things that we decided to focus on was if we tried to be all things to everybody, then I think, you know, and I think this is something you're going to see in the marketplace is the one thing unique with cannabis is the limit you have on how much you can produce and how fast you can produce that product. So we knew that there was definitely an eye to the international market, and there still is. But we also realized that if we tried to go down that road immediately, then we may have trouble servicing the, the customer base <clears throat> that we're trying to create here in Canada. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is interesting on the international market is it's really evolving. And, and Canada is certainly light years ahead of almost all the other markets right now. So I don't think we've missed the boat in any way in the international market. We certainly have a team working on that right now and looking at what markets can we get into um, because there are a lot of them and, and they're evolving and they're certainly all looking to Canada um, for potential supply, at least in the beginning, because I think ultimately most international markets will want to get the benefit of producing domestically as well. You bet. Um, but we certainly have a, of course, we have a, a strong eye to what's happening internationally and, and sure. every intention of, of entering that market as well. Sure. Cashed up as you are, I guess you're ready to execute on opportunities as they come along. Have you, have you looked at the U.S. at all? I mean, U.S. market, I think, as we all know, is... is is difficult, um, and certainly you know, the regulations as they exist, certainly with the TSX and, and as a Canadian publicly traded company are very clear. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be irresponsible if we didn't track and know what was going on in the US at all times, which we do, and we, we keep a very, very close eye on what's happening there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we have to make sure that we stay within the regulations of the exchange and the, the regulations of, of what we're dealing with with Health Canada. Um, obviously a huge market, and it's it is um, a very confusing market, though, as well. You have you know, states that have chosen to legalize. You've got a, a federal policy that is completely opposite to what's happening. So it's, it's I would say it's, uh, I mean, it's an attractive market just because of volume, um, but at the same time, confusing market and one that um, we're certainly watching, but uh, our, our strategy really right now is let's get a strong foothold within the you know, $7 billion Canadian market um, and also continue to look at opportunities elsewhere. You bet. All right, Jay, we're going to leave it there. We'll come back to you in a quarter's time to see how you're doing. Thanks for Fantastic. coming in today. Thank you very much for having me. And we're done. Hey, we're back, we're back, we're back. What do you make of uh, Jay Wilgar? Well, they got quite a story. Yeah, no kidding. $120 million in cash. And uh, what, a 260, 250, 260 market cap? It's uh, yeah. the pullback in their stock after they've cashed up makes, yeah. uh, makes that to become a, the, the cash component not quite 50% or 50 cents uh, of the dollar. That, that becomes significant. Yeah, you Both bet. as downside protection on the stock and as a war chest to go out and do creative things with other companies. I know, and uh, I think that they are actively looking for opportunities with a, with a treasury like that. I mean, what, you gotta do something with it. Oh, yeah. You can't just sit on it. Anyways, uh, Stevie, we're gonna talk to our audience now out there, YouTubers. I wanna say hello to Jonathan Hamill. Justin Marshall, I think, is our new top super fan. He's, he's very, very, very bullish on us. Mr. Lancelot has an interesting question, which I'll come back to. Benjamin Smith is here with us today, as is Mr. Lou1990. Of course, the guy who's always here first. But let's look at Mr. Lancelot's question. He says, I would like to ask James to clarify, for us foreigners, how do sales happen in the not yet legal dispensaries what do they what do they sell and is haiku therefore canopy in the gray area and to that i can tell you mr lancelot that the the operations the storefronts that haiku operates under its various brands tokyo smoke doja and haiku they are not actually selling any cannabis 
infused product. They are not selling any cannabis products. The the logic behind these these storefronts is they're selling their coffee shops, and the idea is that when it is legal to sell cannabis at coffee shops in Canada, which is not in the first iteration of Bill C-45 that takes effect on October 17th, it will have to, it will require some amendments to the bill before anybody can sell actual cannabis products in a coffee shop. And it will be regulated province by province. And it's regulated province by province. But right now, no haiku is not in the gray area and no canopy is not in the gray area because they don't sell any cannabis products. Cannabis Canopy only sells uh, cannabis products currently through the ACMPR regulations, which is by mail. Now, the, re the, the retail recreational story gets started on October 17th, and that's when everything sort of becomes out in the open and, and anybody can buy it who's over, I think it's 18 or 19, I'm not entirely sure, but, uh, but that's, that's the reality of that situation. We still have all of these illegal dispensaries in operation. For example, in the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area up here in Canada, we have something in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 illegal dispensaries that are currently operating. And these are interesting. We'll actually uh, we'll get you some footage of this for a uh, show in a couple of weeks. But the dispensaries are actually selling consumer packaged goods like you can go in there and you can buy a vape pen that's got any range of a bunch of uh, you know extracts oils cannabis right. resins you can buy cookies you can buy edibles you can buy CBD products it's really going to be interesting the I think that the uh, the feds are going to move quickly to accommodate a wider range of cannabis products as soon as the whole thing starts to take effect because that's the only way they're going to be able to compete with these illegal dispensaries. Well, and, and things are unbelievably loose at some of those dispensaries. The, the anecdotal stories are incredible that, mm -hmm. uh, that the prescription is written on a, on a whiteboard so it can be wiped off with your name and all your information and then rewritten. Yep. You know, it just has the, the open uh, uh, lines, well, actually, line they've, items. They've mostly, I mean, I, I visit these dispensaries occasionally strictly for market research purposes, I assure you. And uh, they've, they've, they've dropped the whole pretense of medical cannabis. They, mm. they don't even, there's no more talk to a doctor behind a curtain. There's no more online prescriptions. Now it's just like, if you got ID, you're over 19 years old, they will sell you whatever they got because the cops have stopped harassing them. Yeah. And they've stopped harassing them, and they'll tell you why that is. It's an interesting story. So in uh, 2014, a group of MMAR patients, so MMAR was the medical marijuana access rules that have been in effect in Canada since 2002. And under these rules, a patient who was prescribed cannabis as a remedy by a doctor could grow or appoint somebody to grow their medicine for them. And they tried to implement different restrictions on the quantities, but what would happen is one person would end up being appointed by multiple patients, therefore, thereby obfuscating how much cannabis he was actually allowed to have. And these sources of cannabis were bleeding out into the black market in large scale. There were several high profile arrests. So they eventually, they've changed the rules in 2013. They rolled out the MMPR rules, which was medical marijuana, no, sorry, MMAR, MMPR was medical marijuana purchase, no, protect, I can't remember what it stood for. <laughs> Anyways, MMPR. They rolled out MMPR in 2013, and a group of the MMAR patients sued the government on constitutional grounds for being denied access to their required medicine at reasonable cost, claiming that getting having to source their cannabis only from corporate sources represented a financial hardship. Yes. The Supreme Court judge in April 2014 sided with the plaintiffs, yes. and so the government rolled out the ACMPR rules, which is the ones that now govern us in 2014, which grandfathers in anybody who was an MMAR patient can continue to grow their own or appoint somebody to do it for them. Mm. And anybody else has to get a prescription and buy it from the ACMPR growers. So now what that's done is created a certain uneasiness on the part of law enforcement that if they go in and start arresting 
uh, illegal dispensary operators, which they did pretty aggressively aggressively last year they busted something last like 30 year or 40 the, year be, the year before was really big yeah so yeah. what happened was those of course those cases came to court and 42 percent were thrown out before they even got to court and only a very small portion of them actually resulted in any convictions at all because there's a constitutional hesitation there that hey wait a sec we bust this guy throw him in the clink he's going to challenge us on constitutional grounds and risk upsetting the entire ACMPR and medical legalization of marijuana progress. Yeah. So that's that's what's happening here now. This is a, it's really a minefield for government and for law enforcement. You start throwing Canadians in jail whose only offense is selling cannabis. Now you're you're going to you're, you're kind of creating a constitutional nightmare for the courts because it's constitutionally arguably somewhat unsupportable that only a corporate entity can produce marijuana when it's a plant that grows everywhere. It's also constitutionally unsupportable perhaps that those earlier patients were grandfathered but later patients wouldn't have the same privileges. Sure. I mean if I was if I was somebody who is reliant on cannabis for just my daily sanity, oh wait a sec, I am reliant on cannabis for my daily sanity, but uh, if I had a hardship in acquiring it, I would actually seek to challenge the the Constitution and say, look, if they can access cannabis through growing it themselves or appoint somebody to grow it for them, then why can I not? That is unfair and I challenge that on constitutional grounds. That hasn't happened yet and uh, I think it's because, you know, they're, <laughs> they're waiting to see what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's so, uh, yeah, so. There's, there's also so much anticipation that all of these things are going to become not completely irrelevant, but they'll be become less important as the legalization of recreational comes forth, and 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 they knock off the uh, the various barriers and say, well, what was all that fuss about? So sure, it's premature now, mm -hmm. but it's pending. Okay. Um, there's another viewer, Ben Smith. I don't think that's our Ben Smith, the writer. If it is, Ben, say something so that I know it's you. But Benjamin Smith wants to ask Steve Meisner, what does he think about the potential for recession now that the yield curve is only 28 basis points from being flat? Historically, that always signals recession is imminent. Well, cut your, cut your little curveball there for you, Stevie. Uh, absolutely. One minute we're talking about wheat. Now, we, now, what do you think about that? That's an interesting observation. I mean, I, I'm not super optimistic about the Canadian economy. I, I mean, I, I, there are many economists out there that uh, look at all the details in a lot finer fashion. But I think the trade war issue, uh, uh, if, if, if Canada exports 20% of their GDP to the United States, so the tariff uh, fighting that's going on, it hurts Canada way more than the U.S. It doesn't affect the U.S. Mm. Uh, the th there's about $350 billion both ways, Canada, U.S., give or take. Well, if half of that gets knocked out in the U.S., that's $175 billion. That's 1% of U.S. GDP, but that's 10% of Canadian GDP. So, if, and, and U.S. GDP is already forecast at three and a half next year, and we're forecast 1.3. So, if we lost 10% of our GDP due to this ongoing trade fight, uh, and the U.S. lost one, and Trump picks it up in Asia because the Chinese and the Japanese and the South Koreans are going to buy more U.S. because that's where the $850 billion U.S. trade deficit exists, and Mexico as a separate target, hmm. then Trump could sacrifice 1% GDP to Canada if, if the fight continues. Because he's squeezing the nuts of the Asians. Yeah, and they're going to, and they're going to uh, buy, you know, because that's where the legitimate trade deficit is. It's not with Canada. Huh. But we could lose 10% of our GDP. That's the scary, scary thing. And that's what the Liberal government is, is, is uh, playing with fire. Do you think we could make up that 10% loss in GDP through cannabis product sales globally? $175 billion. Well, right now the Canadian market on its own domestically, medically only is worth $7 billion. Yes. And so if you consider the, if you consider the, the potential for the global market, for example, let's take, for example, Pendianos 
is a, is a subsidiary of Aurora Cannabis. Pendianos is the largest supplier of medical cannabis in Europe. In Germany alone, there's something like 17 million patients that are prescribed cannabis. Out of 85 million people, there's 17 million in Germany? Something, something like that. Don't hold me to that number. Right, I'm actually a, going to check that number. It, it sounds a little rich. That's 20% of the population. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the reality. Any, any patient that is currently uh, taking opiates yes. for a pain condition is a potential. arguably potentially eligible for replacement of opiates yes. with cannabinoids. Yes. So Aurora already owns access to most of these patients. So I mean that could be a tremendous boost to the, not just to Aurora's balance sheet, which it obviously will be, but also to Canadian GDP. Absolutely. But I will, and, and, I, and I don't want to diminish from that possibility because that would be huge for Canada. Although 175 billion to replace it potentially overnight is, is virtually an impossibility. Well, it's not going to happen overnight. Secondly, uh, I think over time that these other governments, uh, the same way that the whole world got into lotteries in the 70s and 1980s, that there were, used to be the Irish sweepstakes and it was the only lottery on the planet, and then Canada introduced the Olympic lottery. Well, eventually, state by state, country by country, they're not going to look at other countries coming and invading their territory with sales forever. Eventually, they'll want in. Now, they can tax it and they get their piece, but eventually, there'll be domestic markets, I think, developed. Huh. Yeah, okay. So, that and it makes won't sense. happen overnight. Canada's the leader. We've got the pioneering advantage and we've got the capital and the thrust and all the know-how and the and and the sales are beginning, which is fantastic. But governments traditionally don't just sit there and watch other governments and other countries Reap eat, eat their lunch windfall. in their own backyard. Right. It just doesn't happen perpetually. Right. Well, hey, maybe they can't grow wheat well, good I mean, as the Canadians. You know, maybe J the Canadians are the best dope Japan doesn't, on the planet. Japan doesn't have any oil, so if you don't have it, you have to import it. But if you can grow it... True. And It's not rocket science. No. It's plant science. It is. <laughs> Anyways, Steve, if you don't mind, I'm going to have a conversation now with my good friend Keith Herker for, from WeedMD. Hey, welcome back to Minus Letter Live. My guest this segment is Keith Merker. He's the CEO, yes, former CFO, but now CEO, EO, of WeedMD, <laughs> trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol Weapons of Mass Destruction. No, WMD. Keith, thanks for joining me. I chose the ticker. You did you? I love the ticker. I love that. I was a trader in a former life, so really? I, uh, I know how that goes. But ticker um, symbol is more important than people realize. In many <laughs> cases, that's how a lot of people, especially in the capital markets, think of the brand. It's like, yep. what's the company name? I don't know. It's WMD. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant brand. Let's start with the elephant in the room. The deal with Haiku got <coughs> sort of sidetracked by the deal with Canopy, and sure. you got 10 million bucks. We for did. your trouble. The consolation prize. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I guess the best way to describe this would be using an analogy, I okay. suppose. And uh, I guess it's the same old story. We're all about analogies here. <laughs> Boy meets girl. Girl meets wealthy, <laughs> eld elderly gentleman <laughs> with a fancy watch and a nice car. And girl walks off with the elderly, uh, wealthy gentleman. Wow, so that's, that's a brilliant analogy right there. WeedMD, if you haven't figured it out, is the boy. Right. And WeedMD is going to be just fine. Yeah, so of course. I've been that boy before. Right. Um, you know, the wonderful thing Builds about... character. Thank you. <laughs> the wonderful thing about that merger is also the wonderful thing about the breakup. And huh. that is that WeedMD brought to the table a very robust production platform, a very robust medical market, uh, a brand in WeedMD, mm -hmm. uh, a great group of people doing a great bunch of things, partnerships on the pharma side, partnerships on the R&D side, Partnerships with groups like Favita on the branding side. Uh, Haiku brought the retail side. Mm -hmm. You know, so together it would have created an interesting uh, opportunity and story. Uh, but as the retail side walks away, WeedMD has been, you know, knocking the ball out of the park for the past few months. Sure. We've, we've ramped up our Strathroy location. We've announced some sh uh, deals with Shoppers Drug Mart. 
with a couple of the provinces, more to come. Right. Uh, and we're growing great product and we're doing great things. Sure. And there's lots of retail strategies yet to come. Exactly. You can create your own. You've got an, an additional $10 million in the treasury. treasury. You can acquire something. You bet. Well, so that's, uh, that's great. That's great. That's a great attitude and, uh, you know, an, just another great turn in the saga of the <laughs> cannabis industry in Canada. Yeah, so absolutely. I love it. Okay, so uh, let's talk about Strathroy. You've got, uh, um, you've got a harvest coming in in September. Uh, you've got deal with Shoppers Drug Mart. There's a retail strategy. Sure. And, uh, and, and so, you know, what, what's, what's the next game? What's the next step? Yeah, and listen, I'd love to have you out to see what's going on in Strathroy because it's very exciting. We um, will come. Yeah, we will no, bring please, camera crew and we are on the way. Please do, because what we've created there, I think, is one of the most unique and uh, high-functioning hybrid greenhouse operations in the ACMPR and surely in the cannabis regulations in Canada. Right. Um, we now have two of our 10,000 square foot grow rooms up and running, populated with over 10,000 plants. And, uh, you know, I was in there yesterday, sorry, two days ago, in the blazing heat outside. It was 75 degrees and comfortable. The relative humidity was in the mid-40s. We were looking at very happy plants on the floor. Um, we're doing a great thing there. Yeah. And those two grow rooms that are now functional will be replicated as we go forward into that full five acres over the next couple months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the happiness of those plants I'm seeing today sort of proves out the model of what we, uh, you know, set out to accomplish in that greenhouse. And uh, I look forward to showing you. Yeah, you bet. I love happy plants. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see them. So the harvest is in September. That actually works well for us because, uh, well, Strathroy is practically in our backyard. Um, let's talk about brand strategy now. Are you going to, like WeedMD, I, I recall that there was a bit of a focus on creating products for, you know, mature adults. Yep. And, uh, and, and is that still the main focus or is that just now another component in the brand strategy? What's your strategy for the recreational market? Yeah, so we are currently developing some new brands uh, which will be you know, exposed to the market in due course. Mm -hmm. uh, but currently we are using the WeedMD brand. The WeedMD brand has been around for four years. Um, it's got a history. People know it, people relate it to the high quality cannabis that we're growing. I mean, another story I can quickly tell you is that in our original Elmer facility, we're growing a strain called wine gums. And I honestly wish you could see them today because the, the, the colas that we're growing are bigger than my arm. So oh, you know, are, I happen to love wine gums anyways. In uh, fact, when I <laughs> smoke too much cannabis, I want wine gums. So there you go. This is you gonna can, be wine gums and wine gums. Two for one. Yeah. So, hmm. so yeah, we're doing some wonderful things there. So my point is that we thought about what we should do for the rec strategy uh, in the immediate term. And what we circled back to is the fact that we have developed a good brand in WeedMD. We've developed a brand where we have people behind it, where we have product behind it, where it's a known entity. And I think that, you know, the name kind of sticks with you. Yeah. So despite what you may be seeing from other LPs currently with respect to press releases around new brands and names that they've released that no one's ever heard of before, WeedMD is going strong, and then we're going to stick with it. Well, wow, very cool. Um, the le agreements that you have with the Alberta Gaming Commission, the BC, uh, you've, you've got agreements in BC. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, liquor distribution model that a lot of the provinces are, are going to uh, sort of feature, are those, um, do you think those are going to be the limit to the recreational brand distribution opportunity for the LPs like WeedMD, or do you think that incrementally the rules are going to ease and they're going to try to make it more broadly available in an effort to curb supply from the black market. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope for the latter. Um, I don't unfortunately write the regulations, but uh, certainly I think that it will be a process that evolves over time. Could. Yeah, I mean, this, this, will all, <laughs> this, will, this will all evolve. Right. Uh, what we will see in three to five years, let alone 10 years hence, is gonna be completely different than what we're gonna see on October 17. Mm -hmm. That much we do know. Uh, are they gonna get it perfect the first time around? No. Uh, did WeedMD get it perfect the first time around? No. Um, it's very rare that you can. Sure. So um, I think that the expansion of retail access is going to be important. And if private retailing is part of that and eases that transition, I think it should be considered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any plans to develop an international strategy either in the United States or Europe? So currently we're not looking at the United States, although 
you know, interestingly, we're, we are partnered with a group called Favita on the beverage side. Right. Favita is about to roll out a very comprehensive strategy in the U.S., and oh. I would encourage you to follow that. Yeah, we've um, had them here before. Actually. Yeah, yeah, they've done a great job, um, and we'll be rolling out their brands in our partnership, our JV here in Canada, uh -huh. shortly. Okay. Um, so that's very exciting for us. That's as close as we're going to get to the U.S. for now. Okay. Globally, stay tuned. Even right. as soon as potentially next week, there'll be some announcements about what we're what we're doing and planning. Really? Wow. Um, we've had a number of things in the works. WeedMD's always tried to take the approach that we announce things when we've accomplished things as opposed to talking about what we uh, think we're going to accomplish. Right. So, Good strategy. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the way we act. Mm -hmm. And we do have a number of irons in the fire internationally, and, and you'll see some of those be exposed to the marketplace shortly. Sure. Are you currently open to joint ventures and partnerships with other retail strategists, other ACMPR growers? We're always open. 24-7? Um, yeah, <laughs> I tell you. Um, I mean, one of the things WeedMD has done that's unique in this industry is uh, we like to say seed the industry. So we have a very comprehensive genetics program, a very wide seed bank, and, and living plants uh, library of genetics that hmm. we currently sell both to home growers as well as, importantly, LPs. Hmm. So we've sold to currently more than 20% of the licensed producers in this country. And by virtue of that, have created a number of strong relationships with other, you know, more junior perhaps, not always, licensed producers across the industry. And I think we've made a name in differentiating ourselves and um, showing how we can act uh, opportunistically to find new revenue streams and ways in which to, um, you know, build a business. Right. And, you know, going back to your original question, yeah, we, I mean, we've got a number of partnerships as a result of that, and we, we will continue to pursue things like that going forward. Well, fantastic. Well, we're going to keep watching. It's great to have you back here. We'll have you back more often, and we're awesome. going to come and visit you. But uh, for now, thank you very much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. I got to tell you, you know, it's a, it's like a manna from heaven. When you think you're doing a deal with one marijuana company, you got the deal all ready to go. And the big kahuna in the industry steps in front of you and says, no, sorry, we're going to buy this company. Here's $10 million. Now get the out of here. And you know, weed MD, look, look at that chart. Look at the weed MD chart. It's look at that drop in price from uh, what? just under $2.10 down to a buck 60 on the bad news of the break. But they get $10 million and on the and news it's, of the And it's non-dilutive money. It's free money. They didn't have to issue 10 million bucks of stock the cost take of take on capital? 10 million bucks of debt. What was the cost of capital on that? Zero. Zippo bippo. Yeah. And look at the market. Any reward there? No, falling no. on deaf ears. I think they must have had I think the dumbest shareholders are the ones who are left behind. The smart shareholders all left when they heard the news. But, you know, talk about a talk about a unintelligent reaction. But remember that there was arbitrage money that may have been involved and arbitrage money is hot money. Yeah. That's you know, a good they point. were betting on the deal. Even though it wasn't a full blown takeover, it's a plan of arrangement, which is kinda of more like a merger, yep. there was still the belief and we are seeing this in the market. The larger cap companies in cannabis are getting rewarded for their larger cap. We're starting to see that in your indices, the Midas letter indices, and we're starting to see that obviously Canopy is the biggest leader. But uh, uh, $10 million is, is pretty good, uh, at, at no dilution, is, is a pretty good kiss if you're yep. going to break up. One of, our, one of our viewers, Jonathan Hamill, says, New Strike and Weed MD should just merge. <laughs> that would be, you know, then, then you'd have two companies with big war chests, but nothing, well, I shouldn't say nothing. They've both got, they've got, both got strategies under, under execution right now, but neither yeah. one of them are quite as, uh, as attractive or, you know, inspiring as, say, a merger with... They would, have, they would have compelling treasury jointly, but I think both of them are trading probably at discounted prices now, mm -hmm. and... Uh, as we looked at when we looked at uh, New Strike earlier, um, uh, and they probably wouldn't find that a favorable move. They're both in a position with their own treasuries to do a deal with another company yeah. and, and stay in control. 
Yeah, um, one of our readers, I, and I'm assuming this gentleman is going to be, or it might be a lady for all I know, but the, the, under the username, Garin Krampf 666 says it's more like 20,000. And I think that's in reference to when we were talking about how many German patients there are in Germany who are licensed. And you said 17 million? <laughs> 20. Hey, like I said, don't hold me to that. No, I don't know why I got that number wrong in my head, but... So he says there's 20,000 patients right now, but you know, that's only going to get bigger, especially, you know, I think. Just to make you feel better, Nancy Pelosi in the U.S. once said that uh, 500 million Americans were going to lose their job due to the tax cuts. <laughs> 500 million. Do you think she misspoke? <laughs> A tad, just a no, tad. I'm gathering by There's the There's only glee. 300 million of them. <laughs> I, the, 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 I just wanted to make you feel better. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Stevie. That, you know, your gaff is just a little minuscule compared to that one. Yep. Heidi Hupp says she's glad to see Steve back on our show. Thanks, James. Steve, thank people you, Heidi. Are loving you. Yeah. <laughs> let's see who else is. Who else we got here? Neil Fletcher says, uh, and this is interesting because Neil is the one who first told us about that. Hey, I heard you guys are setting up a site visit with Crop Infrastructure Court in Humboldt County soon. When will that air? Neil, I can tell you that we are probably going to go shoot a segment at Crop, uh, crop Infrastructure in Humboldt County. I'm thinking next week, because we're going to be in California all next week, touring about the, uh, the medical marijuana world down there with our, with our camera crew. And so when would that air? That probably will not air for a couple of weeks, because we're going to be out on the road doing a lot of remote shoots uh, starting next week. And so there'll be a lot less of us here. However, there'll be some Steve, there'll be some Ed, there'll be some Ben Smith, who's right now in the audience. And, uh, and that reminds me, I want to tell all you guys who are watching right now that uh, tomorrow, Friday at uh, 4.30 p.m., Ben Smith and I are going to do an, a live Ask Me Anything on Reddit forward slash weed stocks. Actually, Reddit forward slash r forward slash weed stocks thread. Uh, that's a 50,000 member thread on, on Reddit. And so we're going to simulcast the Ask Me Anything. And questions have already been pouring into my inbox. It's amazing. We're going to simulcast the answers. And Ben and I are going to discuss the answers here and, uh, and shoot them out to you. So that's from 4.30 p.m. tomorrow, Eastern Time, till 6.30 p.m. So we're going to cover a lot of cannabis topics. I, I got to tell you that a lot of the fans that or a lot of the uh, questions that have been coming in are clearly well thought out. Like, guys have really... <laughs> we're going to have to do some homework. It's a good thing we got some lead time on these questions because it's like, wow, that's a great question. I don't have the answer at the top of my tongue. I got to go do some research, which is kind of thrilling. So if you're interested, you got to come and watch that tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, tomorrow's going to be me and Ben Smith. So we'll be looking for your questions on, you can either ask them on the, on the chat on YouTube and or on Reddit, weed stocks. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out to any Facebook users who might be saying, hey, what happened? You guys started out, you were on Facebook every day. Turns out Facebook has changed their privacy requirements and permissions in such a way that the live video uh, component is no longer compatible with our system. So we're working with Facebook and New Tech, who is the manufacturer of our, our uh, automated studio, to rectify that situation. but. It's not going to happen before I leave for sunny California. So sorry. Sorry about that, Facebook users. Going to come and watch on YouTube. Or you can just watch it on MidasLetter.com. Look at our front page of our screen. It's on there right now. You can even use the chat thing there. Well, Facebook is tightening up their you know, their rulings mm, uh, and, they and got their slap, slap. Yeah, well, slap that I, ass. I don't even think it was a slap. They got fined in the UK They did yesterday. They were fined. 500,000 pounds, you know, <laughs> like, like 800,000 Canadian dollars. Oh yeah, Mark the, Zuckerberg's just they, spinning in his grave. It's Wait, calculated yeah, yeah. based on their current level of earnings that they earn that back in 18 minutes. How is that, what does that constitute a fine? That's not even a slap. No. That's not even a, it's no, just it's a, like when they give one of these professional sports guys a 10 grand, a guy who makes 20 million a year. Jesus, I so don't there you know go. about that. Anyways, um, there's a new company in town, another new cannabis company that's going to start trading in August. I 
do believe I was told yesterday. And the gentleman who is the interim CEO is a guy named Karim Malik. And you might recognize Karim because he's on BNN and he's an analyst, a chartered financial analyst like Steve here, and he's been in the cannabis space since it pretty much got going. In fact, that's why BNN has them on because none of their people know anything about cannabis. No, just kidding, BNN. Ah, <laughs> we love you. No, we don't. Uh, anyways, the uh, <laughs> the bottom line is uh, that we're going to now visit with Karim and hear the story of Biome Grow. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest this segment is Karim Malik. He's the CEO of Biome Grow. It says interim CEO here, Karim. What, what is with interim? Well, you know, I mean, our, my background is investment banking and yeah. you know, building companies or telling other people what to do. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have what we call affectionately founder syndrome. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a very credible management team coming on board to run this and also a board of directors, which I think will be second and none in the industry. Wow. Because at the end of the day, look, we've been forecasting and studying the sector for a while. So there are a lot of things lacking. So the two things I lack there are just to, to go into it, lack of corporate governance on the board side of things. And then on the management side of things, you don't have a lot of managers running these cannabis companies that have run large, complicated businesses before, right? You've got people that have run 20 or 30 person businesses or high growth to a certain point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, running companies where you've got a couple hundred employees, a variety of distribution platforms and production assets in different jurisdictions, it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an ask. So uh, having a credible done before team is key, which is why the interim fellow has brought it to the point that, that we could, and now we're gonna have an entire team come in and sort of run it, which we'll announce very shortly. Oh, okay. Um, tell us what Biome Grow does because Nobody knows at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a, our cannabis project. We've sort of kept under uh, under covers for uh, for the last two years. We've been working on just recently it brought it out because we're going public. So mm -hmm. I think the world should know what we've been up to. Sure. Uh, basically, what it came down to was uh, you know, we looked at the Canadian market and we looked at the international market and. Uh, Cannabis looked uh, as a global leader right now in terms of at least one thing, you know, producing cannabis at an industrial scale. Rightly or wrongly, that's where it looked at. That's a narrow window of opportunity there where we can leverage that and sort of establish our Canadian way of doing things elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That's a very large market out there. But, uh, you know, to do that properly, you've got to have a beachhead in Canada and then look elsewhere. Um, and this, but getting establishing a beachhead account is tricky. And if, you haven't, if you're not one of the big guys with a large balance sheet, you've, you've had several years to figure out how to do things, it's tricky. So when we looked at this thing two years ago when we were putting it together, we figured out a way, in our opinion, that we can establish a very credible, sustainable cannabis platform, even though we're a little later to the game, uh, while leveraging that to get some very interesting and aggressive international opportunities up and running to make this a truly global platform. And quite frankly, in about two or three years, if we're not doing the bulk of our sales overseas, something dramatically has gone wrong in our execution. Yeah, I see. That's interesting. So you've certainly had the benefit of uh, ringside seat watching everybody else's mistakes. True. And so I'm assuming that you're putting that experience to good use in biome. Oh, exactly, I mean, not only sitting and watching, we made mistakes along the way with our, when we were servicing some of the guys which are the largest cannabis companies in, in the country, in the world for that matter. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about going set is later on is you know you can deploy capital more uh, efficiently, mm -hmm. but the downside obviously you don't have that balance sheet or that you know, large production facility and footprint ready to go the day recreational goes live. Mm -hmm. So we will have that, but uh, we're, we'll ramp up to, and uh, we think is more of a, uh, an intelligent matter for somebody who's is building a slightly different sort of uh, mid-sized platform in Canada, but building a very aggressive and large platform elsewhere. Sure. If I was to, you know, just scan the headlines for the last few uh, months, I would get the impression that you were a maritime focused participant. Yeah. So when we were looking at, okay, how do we establish something that'll survive in Canada? Because look, we got over hundred licenses right now. It'll go up to north of 200 something when it hits the apex. And when supply and demand normalizes, it's going to whittle down to a very small number at the end of the day. So how do you build something coming later that's going to survive what I call the day of reckoning? That's what and I'm wondering. once you come to the other side of the day of reckoning, you will flourish and thrive. So, so that's why Atlanta, Canada, quite frankly, at the end of the day, there's very few licenses east of Ontario. 75% mm -hmm. of all licenses are either in BC or in uh, Ontario for that matter. And Atlanta Canada is highly underserved. We're actually very active with some of the other companies in Atlanta Canada, cr creating you know, billions of dollars of economic sort of uh, value there. So we've got entrenched relationships out there. Plus, we're building uh, brands in Canada, which I think are rather unique compared to other people. There's an argument going on, what does the cannabis brand look like? Uh, if we do our job properly and build brands appropriately for Atlantic Canada, you know, they're very local through the local brands, right? If you build local, you employ local, you entrench yourself in the local ecosystem there, they will support you, uh, you know, uh, uh, through a lot of things. Even if you're higher priced, your quality may not be there, not that we're going to shoot for lower quality or anything. 
uh, which doesn't exist in other parts of the country. There may be a few provinces here and there, but Latin Canada's region is very, very low, particularly in Newfoundland. If, Ontario is different, right? We yeah. will buy from anyone. They have a good right. right. So, <laughs> Cheaper uh, than yeah, better. So we're headquartered here because a lot of our senior executive teams would prefer to be based here, but most yeah. of our operating assets for Canada are in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Atlanta, Canada. We do have a production facility under construction here in Ontario, but uh, frankly, it'll probably supply Atlanta, Canada for the next little while, and then we'll turn our attention to uh, Ontario. Ontario is more of a medical market for us for now. Sure. So what does the actual growth profile of the company look like in terms of productivity? Sure. So we're licensed in Nova Scotia right now. We should be, uh, I think, the first uh, company in Nova Scotia to be in a position to actually sell cannabis later on the summer. Uh, Newfoundland will be up and running in terms of a license uh, later on this year as well in the second half. Well, and in the next few months, we'll have Ontario licenses as well. So three licenses this year. We have one right now and two additional licenses beyond that in uh, Canada in Q1 of next year. So five in total. Okay, so uh, how much capacity production right now? Uh, right now, it's pretty small. It's a small 7,000 square foot facility in, in, um, in uh, Nova Scotia, which roughly translates to about 500 kilogram run rate. Mm -hmm. We're expanding an additional 100,000 square feet there, that, which is what, where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. Our biggest facility will be in Newfoundland, which is about 168,000 square feet, and that can probably do, the way we're building it, about uh, 16 to 17,000 kilograms a year. Hmm, fantastic. Dry product. Sure. Okay. So, how much uh, how much money have you raised? What's the capital structure look like? Who are the big shareholders? Sure. Uh, it, it's interesting. So, uh, well, part of building our local ecosystem is we raise a lot of our initial capital in Atlantic Canada from you know movers and shakers and influential individuals who you know are, uh, can help us down the road in Atlantic Canada. So, we've raised about ten million dollars so far, and uh, we are just about uh, raising an additional fifteen right now to sort of uh, get, get us to where we need to go. Once we're listed, we'll do something bigger later on down the road, but. Uh, if we're good at one thing uh, beyond anything else, we know how to stretch an investor dollars. So mm -hmm. with, with less than $10 million, I think we've built a pretty significant platform here. And the way we did it is we raised tiny amounts as we went along, not to dilute existing shareholders. Because what often happens in the sector is, you know, you need to raise a lot of money to do anything. It's very expensive to build a cannabis facility in Canada. So effectively, when you're ready to actually produce and sell, you've diluted the heck out of your, your existing shareholders. You know, your founders and your early investors are down to 5 to 10%. So the way we did it, and we, this is what, a commitment we made to our investors, we'll, we'll build you a de-risk cannabis platform, which will survive the onslaught and thrive, quite frankly. But also, you will still own quite a bit of the company the way we will raise money. Uh, you know, by the time we're public and trading on a lot. So they, they own considerably more of the company than a typical cannabis company at our stage would, uh, would, and would have. So that's the plan. I mean, ultimately, we're going to have to raise about $80 million, and we've got visibility on where that's coming from, to prosecute our domestic production here in Canada, which results in roughly about $250 million of revenue. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the returns aren't too bad, but also, you know, our facilities are different than other people's. So they're unique. Uh, there's unique IP there. We build highly automated facilities. We brand uniquely in Canada. So it's not your run-of-the-mill pot producer. It's uh, we're doing things differently. Wow, yeah. interesting. Um, besides the East Coast component, uh, what what is it exactly that you're going to sort of try to do differently in the product category? No, fair enough. So again, it, what it really boils down to is you've got to have a high quality product. So our strains will be, and everyone can sort of say this, they'll be different than other people's, uh, which are unique to the province. Uh, but also, you know, we segment our provinces individually. So our Nova Scotia brand is specifically for Nova Scotia. We produce and primarily only sell in Nova Scotia. Our facilities are small to mid-size. So we understand a Nova Scotia customer. So for example, a 50-year-old single dad in Nova Scotia has very different purchase triggers than a 50-year-old single dad in Newfoundland, even though he's right next door, mm -hmm. versus New Brunswick. So in terms of delivery mechanisms, in terms of branding, in terms of what the genetics are, It'll be specifically tailored to that uh, province, and when we can do additional derivatives, they'll, be, they'll have a very Atlantic Canadian focus to them. And uh, the, where the real innovation resides for us is on the medical side. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, we've got a very senior medical advisory board coming on board uh, with the, basically the leading doctors in Canada in some of the year uh, low-hanging fruit areas such as sleep, pain, oncology, uh, men's health, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that are going to help sort of chart our path forward there. So I mean. Uh, it's a very, very credible team for a company that is, you know, relatively young on the sector. So that should hopefully give people sort of a comfort that, uh, you know, it's not a run-of-the-mill uh, cannabis company that's just trying to take advantage of the euphoria, which yeah. is not the case here. You bet. Uh, Karim, I can't help but uh, veer over to a macro look at the sector because sure. you cover the sector and have, have done so as long as I have. And so I, I don't know of anybody else I can generally have these conversations with. But since the onset of the first... ACMPR companies and they had the luxury of being first and so they kind of took their time and they didn't move too fast but now that all of these licenses are coming out from uh, Health Canada mm -hmm. and the onset of rec uh, recreational rather is here 
they, everybody's sort of rushing around to stake out market share sure. and build a moat around it as best they can and position for the U.S. Go Federal uh, event that we know is going to happen one day, arguably. Um, and then there's, of course, Europe and, and South America. And you see all these these battles shaping up between the giants and localized little guys mm -hmm. who have rushed in to stake what was one of the few opportunities left in the whole global space. Sure. So do you think that any of these little guys who have fired themselves up and are now competing for market share in markets where the, call it the top three being Aurora, Freya and Canopy obviously, yeah. are able to deploy a lot of capital acquire a lot of local expertise and influence the you know the decision making process at the government level by virtue of their size and economic representation do you think the small companies have any chance of survival? Well, that's a very leading question. So uh, I see where, you, where your position is on this, but uh, <laughs> and quite frankly, I agree with you. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you're small and you're relatively new, which is what the bulk of the relatively, you know, the last 40 licenses in, in Canada are, they're first timers. Right. Small, the first timer is what you should be focused on more than the small side of things. As we've learned from the folks that have been up and running for a while, it's really challenging, first of all, to be able to grow. And it's really challenging to grow. So even if you're an incumbent and one of the bigger guys, when they expand their facility from 100,000 square feet to 200,000 square feet, pretty much everything falls apart mm -hmm. again. So they're still trying to figure out how to grow, which is not well understood in the sector. Right. So um, if you've, the vast majority of the people have got licenses in the last, let's say, nine months, it's going to take them a year to figure out how to get any decent quality product out the door. So that's your biggest challenge, provided you find the capital to build these things out. And you're right, uh, the uh, provinces are a little desperate for product right now because they realize, you know, once all this inventory people are sitting on is flushed out, where, they, where is it going to come Where is it gonna come from? And uh, yeah, so the, which is why they're favoring the big guys because they're the ones they can provide right away and they're leveraging that to get, you know, multi-year commitments potentially. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be challenging for the small guy. I mean, so, you know, not having distribution, not having the balance sheets and not knowing how to grow properly the way we are forced to grow. Uh, means most of these small guys probably, yeah, they may last for a little while, but when I think supply demand normalizes middle of 2020, roughly, uh, and that may change depending on what happens, but uh, they're going to they're struggle. So us being right now a small guy, we were, we're building a very different company. So what differentiates us from these guys are we built some of these facilities for the bigger guys. We know how to grow, right? right. So when we got our license in Nova Scotia last year, we got a license within six days of the building being finished because we're a known commodity to Health Canada. We, sure. we built it the way we helped build other people's facilities, right? And uh, we're almost ready to, you know, we've grown several crops where our competing LPs in, uh, in uh, Nova Scotia are still, we haven't heard from them. So, right. And so you kind of have your own, your own sort of pedigree in terms of access to capital yeah. because that's what you've been doing for all of these other guys. So I think, I mean, I do hope it didn't sound like I was suggesting buy no, no. doesn't have it. No. Hope, but that's what I'm trying to say is, without a differentiator like superior access to capital yeah. and the benefit of the experience of all the companies you've been involved with, uh, a new startup, like a, I can't tell you how many companies I, I hear from who are like, you gotta come and check out our place. We're going public, we've got right. 15,000 square feet and we're gonna, we're gonna grow the best and the most. Yeah. And it's like, boy, that, it's been almost a year and a half since I've heard anybody even <laughs> credibly trying to say that, who knew that that right. kind of a statement had zero credibility right. anymore. So, so that, I guess, is my point, is that there's a lot of companies out there now. It's like the old mature mining market. I right. use uranium as an example. When the uranium bull took off yeah. back in 2006, I guess it was, the, there were, you know, first there were 10 companies, then there were 50 companies, then there were 400 companies. Right. Well, after company 100, none of those companies are around to this day. And exactly. they, they were all essentially Me Too companies right. that really didn't have a chance out of the gate. Right. And so the benefit of that experience is that, you know, it's first mover advantage, especially in capital markets. Certainly. Powered companies yeah. is key. Exactly. So uh, I think, sounds to me like Biome's gonna do great and I can't wait to come and visit the facilities with yeah. camera crew and yeah. uh, and tip a little East Coast point. Anytime. Well, we can come out to Ontario and check out what we have here. So I'll leave you with this. I mean, this is how, I, as an investor, I look at the space in general, which you sort of touched on really well. So it depends on your risk tolerance. So, you know, you can invest in funds now that are cannabis oriented or you can invest in the large companies. So by and large, I'd, I'd recommend most people invest in the larger companies. Uh, if you've got a higher risk tolerance, then you want to go for some, you know, the next tier or the next tier down because they haven't gone on their big run yet once they execute, provided they are able to execute. So when you look at a, the, the big three or the big four, what's the upside for them over the next two or three years? Maybe a double, maybe a triple, right? So whereas if you're, you can find a smaller company like us 
your upside trajectory over the next 12 months is considerably more, but you've got to get comfortable with the fact that it's de-risk enough for someone to pull the trigger. So all we're saying is you're getting, with us, you're getting the valuation of a newbie license with a very credible done it before team, not only in the cannabis space, but in other industries that have shepherded small companies to very large companies in a short period of time and, it's, and an successful track record. Right. So that, that's, how, that's our value proposition. And uh, I don't think there's many that are relatively new licenses, I can say that. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, we're going to follow with interest. Thanks very much for joining me today. Pleasure. That was a pretty good party last night that those guys threw, eh, at Biome? It was a launch event. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like it I wasn't say, it was, a party. Uh, it was. A, I had a hell of a good time at that party. We played ping pong. We uh, we drank lots of cider. You tried out the. Uh, I tried out the virtual reality, and now it's 4:22. It's the cannabis product of the day moment. <laughs> so the product of today, we're going to give Biome an extra boost. So they've got this pretty cool thing called. Weed VR, Weed Virtual Reality. And what it is, is a virtual dispensary. So at the event, they actually had these, this uh, virtual reality headset. You put it on and this is what you see. You've got these handsets and you reach out just like that. That's what you're seeing inside the thing. And you pick up the, the bud and then all these little augmented reality information things pop up around it and you can like see what the THC is, see what the CBD content is. You can look closely at, the, at, the, at all of the, all of the uh, components of the bud and you can compare it to the other ones. And so this facility is a way for cannabis users to compare one to the other, compare the actual data on each of them, the CBD THC content, so that you can actually pick one that's sort of got the metrics that you've grown used to as, as you become accustomed to using marijuana. Because a lot of people, you know, especially first time users, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but first time users, uh, typically, you know, they, they smoke a few times, they don't feel anything, and then they smoke, hit the right connection, and boom, they're so gooned that they're giggling like school children and everything tastes wonderful and the music sounds so amazing because it's their first time being high. Yes. And then they try, they spend years trying to recapture, Replicate recreate that, that original yeah. sensation, which is never possible. You never feel the same way after those first glorious highs. I mean, it's a fleeting moment in, the, in every, should be in every human's evolution if you ask me. But, uh, you know, but this is a way after that typically you're you're going to be one of two people you're going to be the kind of person who either can be high and fully functional or you're going to be like me i get high and i am catatonic antisocial and downright you know i'm zoned right out it's like what what were you talking to me you know unless of course i smoke the right weed which for me is a modest thc high cbd sativa because the sativa characteristic is it's a lot more brighter and more sort of mentally active than would be an indica, which tends to be more physical in its feeling and it makes you like feel like you're like body stone, man. Like some people love that stuff. I mean, personally for me, I'm a sativa guy. I mean, I used to be a heavyweight, now I'm a lightweight. I used to smoke every day, I could smoke the strongest. You know, actually, you know what? I've never tried any of those super concentrates like the shatter, the butter, the wax. Never tried one. It's like, that's just too much THC in a single dose, people. Too much. That uh, body stone you're talking about, that's why they had beanbag chairs and black lights. Yeah, that's right. And lava lamps. <laughs> you get high, sit in the beanbag chair, stare at the lava lamp with Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin cranking. And uh, speaking of Led Zeppelin, have you heard those new kids that are making the rounds uh, in the concert halls these days They're called Greta Van Fleet? I'm aware of the band, yeah. I yeah. haven't seen them though. Yeah, well, I haven't seen them. They played at Rebel here last weekend and okay. I meant to go and I missed it and I was so pissed off because this kid, the lead singer, it's, the, the band's really remarkable because the bass player and the uh, guitar player, they look like they were you know, basically cast from the same mold. They're both tall, skinny kids with long hair, 
and and then this this lead singer is this this little sort of uh, you know energetic guy, and he's got this crazy voice. Like it's seriously, when you hear it, it sounds like Robert Plant when Robert Plant was young. Even Robert Plant acknowledges that, yeah, the guy sounds like somebody I know. Oh, really? Robert mm -hmm. Plant's commented on them. I yeah. See. Okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, and it's interesting because you see these guys' uh, YouTube videos, and they're, you know, a lot of people say, wow, this is amazing. But a lot of people are like, oh, you're just a Led Zeppelin ripoff. And it's like, it's so mean spirited to say, you know, especially to a bunch of young kids, it's just a Led Zeppelin ripoff. These kids grew up listening to Led Zeppelin. Their parents were big time into like all the oldies. And so these kids are merely reflecting their musical education. But I tell you what, this band sticks together and none of them OD or anything as a lot of kids tend to do who make it famous too hot too fast, fly too close to the sun. And by the way, last I heard, Led Zeppelin's not touring anymore. Well, and neither are the Beatles. No, I think I think I saw the last performance by Robert Plant without yes. Led no, Zeppelin. No, I, I know ago. Led Zeppelin's not touring. Robert yeah. Plant was at Ontario Place yeah. uh, in June. But these kids are going to morph from being uh, like they sound. They're sound. All their original songs sound like just. They're very closely structured to Led mm. Zeppelin tunes. Yeah. And so they're going to, you know, they're going to evolve past that, I'm assuming, if they stick together and, and stay focused and don't screw up. But uh, I I'm wanted to, sorry, I wanted to come back to the VR okay. issue just for a moment, if that's sure. okay. Yeah. When they were, when you were showing the uh, examples of the Mango Kush, for example, mm -hmm. I just thought, um, is, would it, how, how uh, similar would the potencies of THC and CBD be by various growers of this seed or this strain of cannabis from completely different companies? Maybe an East Coast, a West Coast, I mean, whatever might be the other variables. Is it fair to say, and how tight would those numbers overlap to say in this, I think in this case it showed the uh, THC was 16%, for example, I think that was up earlier. So my question is, can you take the plant uh, by its strain and the seed and say, generally speaking, mango kush is going to be, mm, is going to be 16%? Quantitatively, no, because the THC percentage of the plant by weight overall when it's dried and the CBD content by weight when it's dried is very much a function of how much trichome generation you can get through optimum growing conditions. So you take three seeds and give them to three different guys. Unless those guys are all growing identically the same, there will be some variation in the actual quantities of each of these substances, but in general, in a phenotype identical to one or you know similar phenotypes or identical seed uh, parents should yield the same ratio of CBD to THC. So in that respect, you know genetically they will they will maintain that similar similarity, but quantitatively it will be differentiated based on how it's grown, where it's grown, how long it's grown, you know. Um, and a follow up. If you took, uh, rather than seeds, if you did it from clippings, which means the plant is that clones, much, yeah. you know, clones, if you went that way, would, would they be more similar? Or it's really the finishing growth perspective that gives you the end potencies? Yeah, if you, you know, the, the, nutrient, the nutrient mix and the atmospheric chemistry of the plant while it's growing is always going to affect the THC, CBD, quantitatively. So, um, you know, be it from clone or from seed, you're going to get variations in the quantitative metrics based on how much, how much trichome generation you have in the final phases of budding. So, uh, you know, another feature would be if you have a outdoor crop, for example, and you're growing these, these buds and there's lots of wind and lots of, uh, you know, physical Agitation. Agitation of the plant, then they're going to drop a lot of those trichomes during the budding oh, phase. Oh, I see. And so, again, if you're in an indoor situation or in a greenhouse where you can control the movement, control how many times the plant is actually uh, agitated or vibrated, you know, those are all going to be affecting the actual content of the, of the THC and CBDs. I'm going to cut to, it's 4.30 now. This is generally as long as we go. We were a little late starting, but uh, 
I'm just going to jump over here to the live dashboard and see if there are any. <laughs> Neil Fletcher says, yeah, Facebook is garbage. Delete your profiles. Ooh, tell us how you really feel. So no show next week, Mr. Lancelot. It's, I'm not going to say no show, but it's going to be a lot different from what we're used to. The, the, the truth of the matter is we're starting to shoot a documentary film that we're going to be working on throughout the summer. We're also going to be going and visiting a lot of different dispensaries, a lot of different grow operations, extraction operations throughout the United States and on the west coast of Canada. We're going to be spending a lot of time with Canopy Growth this summer. We're going to be shooting all of their facilities across Canada. We're going to be interviewing Bruce Linton on location. We're going to talk to their math master grower. I think it's Matthew Harris is his name, if I'm not mistaken. And so this summer is all about generating a whole bunch of video that we can insert into our live feed when we come back in September. So after Labor Day, this platform should be almost unrecognizable from this one, though our show will still be every day at 3.30 till 4.30. 3 to 4.30, 3.30 to 4.30. We're not sure exactly what yet, but Mr. Steve Miser is going to be a regular guest, or regular host rather. Honest Eddie Molesky is going to be a regular host. We've got some other really interesting people that we're talking to about hosting their own segments, but the idea is that we're going to come back and we're going to have eight hours per day, five days per week, 20 different hosts, Every marijuana company in North America will be featured on our show at one point or another, either glowingly or disparagingly, depending on what we think of them. And don't forget, we are conflicted on all these companies we talk about. They could be clients. We could own their shares. We might have options. We might just have bought the stock a lot cheaper than everybody else got it for. So I just want anybody who's watching who's an investor to keep in mind that we are market participants we are not journalists. This is not unbiased information. This is market participant. And so that's why we think it's more valuable. And that's why we call, call it Midas Letter Ra. Anyways, thank you guys all for watching. Hopefully we'll get Facebook sorted out by September. If I don't make it back from the crazy trials and tribulations of California, then it's been nice knowing you. No, but I will be back. We're going to, uh, next week, we're going to have, uh, we're going to feature, do a big feature on Liberty Health Sciences, George Scorsese's company. Uh, Liberty Health Sciences is a, uh, is, uh, is basically a free as US play. You might think otherwise, but it's still a free as US play. Don't let it fool you. Anyways, we'll be back next week. Don't forget to subscribe. Feel free to send in questions anytime to Midas Letter at MidasLetter.com and we'll try to get them on the air. We're doing, oh yes, don't forget, sorry, we're doing our Ask Me Anything, me and Ben Smith, tomorrow here at 4.30. We'll have the regular show starting at 3, and I hope to see you then. Thanks again for watching.